Today, I'm gonna to share with you five things or facts that you need to know if you wanna get into lasering. And we're gonna do it while reviewing the Sculfin SFA940 watt laser. I cannot believe we are saying 40 watts. And I suppose I could also say 20 watts because of a really neat feature on this laser, which we'll get into later on. Hi everyone, I'm Ainsley from Small Fry Creations, where we tackle everything DIY, and let's roll the intro and get to work. A quick disclaimer at the top of this video, Sculfin has sent out the SFA9 for me to review, but they don't see the review before it goes live, nor do they have any restrictions on the content that I can make with the laser. Now, if you are intending on buying one of these machines, a lot of the features you'll see are the same throughout the Sculfin lineup. So if you do wanna go and buy one, I would suggest going to check out my other reviews of the laser machines, and then come back to watch this one, and all of the features that set this laser apart from the others will go through as we head through the facts. Now with that disclaimer out of the way, let's head over to fact number one. Material settings are the same for everybody. This could not be further from the truth. I constantly see in Facebook groups and in YouTube comments, people asking what the particular power and speed settings are for the material that they want to use. And although this may seem logical, in reality, that's just not going to work because there's so many factors at play. How old is the laser head? How clean is the laser head? If you're using plywood, how much glue is in the plywood? It can even come down to what the humidity is in the location that you're using the laser. I always recommend to people when you want to introduce a new material to your laser, you want to do a material test. And this could not be easier because there is so many advancements in the Lightburn software that you can now do material tests right inside the software. Depending on whether you want to cut or engrave, you can go into the material test settings in Lightburn, set some parameters and run tests on the material that you want to use. And then it's really handy because you can keep that for the future and when you want to use the same material, you may be looking for a different result. For example, you may want a darker engrave on something and then a lighter engrave on something else that is the same material. So you can use this as a guide to set your settings. Once your laser stops working, that's the end of your laser. Now this myth is kind of true, kind of not, it depends on the brand and also what's wrong with your laser. For your laser head, it is made up of a bunch of different beams depending on how powerful it is, and those beams come down through a channel and through a lens at the end. And nine times out of 10, when your laser head is not firing correctly, it actually has something to do with the lens and not the laser head itself. Now these laser lenses should be considered a consumable product, which most people don't realize. And depending on the brand of your laser will depend on whether or not it's included in the box, whether or not you can purchase them online and some brands just don't include them at all. What I love about the Sculfin brand is for a long time now, they've been including replacement lenses in the box. They're really easy to switch out and it means that you have really limited downtime and you can keep your projects moving. Now when it comes to the life of your laser and the lens, it's really gonna be impacted by a couple of different things. How clean you keep the lens, what power you have the laser head running on a consistent basis, and even what material you're using with the laser. Some materials will affect the lens differently. Now in terms of power, I always try and recommend to stay under 85% where you can. If you can do that, you will really extend the life of the laser head. Like all things, if you have them running at 100% power, 100% of the time, it is going to lead to quicker burnout. Now in in terms of cleaning, I recommend to use Isopro when you're cleaning the lens. It's really quick and easy. And at minimum, you wanna be cleaning the lens at the end of every day after use. And if you've got the laser running all day long, you wanna be cleaning it regularly. It will not only keep it clean and extend the life of the lens, but it will also mean that the power settings you have set in your software is actually what's going to be coming out of your laser head. You'll know when you need to clean it because you get built up on the nozzle. And like I said, it's really easy to do. You wanna keep an eye on it and you wanna be doing it regularly. Can a diode laser cut clear acrylic or perspex? This has to be the number one question I get asked when it comes to laser engravers. And the simple answer is no, it cannot. It does not matter the brand or the power of the diode laser, the diode beam cannot penetrate through the clear acrylic. Even if you have the protective coating on the top and the bottom, the laser will cut both the top and the bottom layers, but it will not penetrate through the clear acrylic or perspex. There are a bunch of hacks out there using spray paint and other things where you can do that. 
but out of the box, that's not what the laser is designed to do. If you are wanting to cut or engrave clear acrylic, you wanna look for a CO2 machine. Now in saying that, the laser can cut acrylic. The only color I recommend is black. You could probably get away with some other darker colors, but I have had phenomenal results with cutting and engraving black acrylic. Lasering is dangerous and precaution needs to be taken. This statement is more true today than it has ever been. It blows my mind that really over the course of two years, we have gone from lasers that are five watt to 40 watt and they are commonplace in the workshop. And with that speed of innovation comes the need to stop, do some research and make sure that you're taking the right precautions so that you and the people around you remain healthy. Now you really wanna be operating your laser in an enclosure. For the purpose of this video, so that you can see the laser in in its full form. I make sure that I don't have it in the enclosure, but I have recently built one, which I'll link above. And if you don't wanna build your own one, you can purchase them. I think just about every brand of laser now sells one, Sculfin does as well, which I will link down below. And on top of the laser enclosure, you wanna make sure you're in a well-ventilated area with fans and windows and doors open. And for yourself, you wanna make sure that you are wearing glasses because if you expose your eyes to that laser beam over an extended period of time, you will damage your eyesight. You only get one pair of eyes, so let's take care of them. You also wanna be wearing a mask just so you're not taking in any of those last fumes that might be around because the amount of smoke that these machines put out, particularly at 40 watts, is insane. Even really 20 watts and above, the amount of smoke that starts coming out of these machines is crazy. You want to make sure that you are taking the right precautions. Now on top of all of those safety precautions, you also want to be doing your research on the materials that you're using with your machine. You want to do some research on whether or not the fumes that come off that material are toxic or if they are safe. If you're unsure and you can't find it on the internet, then you definitely want to jump into the Facebook group for the brand of laser that you're with. I always recommend that you join them because they're a great source of information and ask people in there because someone will be able to tell you whether or not it's an okay material or not. For example, when it comes to leather, yes, the machines can cut them and engrave them, but you want to make sure that it is 100% leather. Anything else, it can put off toxic fumes and you want to stay well away from it. The same goes for materials like vinyl and galvanized steel, things like that. You just want to make sure you're doing your research to maintain that you are safe and lasering for a long time to come. More power in the laser means you can cut thicker material. This is a myth I'd like to bust today with some facts. In fact, it's this piece of information that has completely shaped this review because during my testing of the A9, I managed to catch some 18 mil plywood on fire while trying to cut through it. And it was this accident that made me really stop and think about the misconception that is out there. And if you are a beginner, what information do you really need and want to know if you're going to get into lasering? Now I can understand as a beginner how you could make the assumption that more power means you could cut thicker material. Because if you look at any of the advertising campaigns for any lasering company out there, particularly at 40 watts, they love nothing more than telling you how thick a material their laser head can get through. Sculfin is no different. If you head over to their website, it will advertise that it can cut 30 mil basswood and it will also be shown in their videos. And sure, if you can replicate the exact same test environments, it's probably true, but it doesn't reflect everyday life. The best way for me to explain this to you is if you think about going to buy a new car. They will tell you that it can do six liters per 100 kilometers. And sure, if you can replicate the exact same test and weather conditions, that's probably true. But what's more like real life is out in everyday driving, you're probably going to get results more like eight to 10 liters per 100 kilometers. And lasering is the same. In my opinion, lasers that are around that 40 watts can comfortably cut through nine mil of plywood or MDF. Anything over that nine mil mark, I think you want to be looking at something like a CNC machine. If you are a beginner and you're looking at getting into lasering, these are my recommendations. If you only want to engrave, you could comfortably get away with a five watt laser and get some fantastic results with incredible detail. If you wanted to cut material that's around about that three mil mark, anywhere from 10 to 20 watts will get you to do that comfortably. And if you are looking to cut up to that nine mil, anywhere between 20 and 40 watts 
will be able to do that. What you get in more power is speed and efficiency. For example, when I was cutting three mil plywood back on a 20 watt laser, it was taking me 700 millimeters per minute at two passes and 75%. Whereas if I wanna get through the same thing today, I could comfortably run it at a thousand millimeters per minute, one pass and 80% power. So what you're getting in more power is speed and efficiency. I have tried to cut through thicker material. Like I said, I caught the plywood on fire trying to get through 18 mil. I also then tried it in an environment where I wasn't doing passes over and over in the same confined space. I tried to cut out this push stick. Again, it's on 18 mil plywood and I cut it off. I almost made it through, but I just comfortably could not get through that material. Again, I think this is better suited for a CNC. Trying to cut three mil, nine mil, six mil templates fantastic, super quick, super efficient, really great, clean, accurate cuts. So if you're out there looking at lasering, you really wanna think about what do you wanna be doing with the laser and trying to get the laser that will be able to do that. Like I mentioned at the top of this video, the best part of the A9 in my opinion is that you can switch it from 20 watts to 40 watts. Then you're really covering everything that you wanna be able to do. If you wanna engrave, you're still gonna get fantastic detail at 20 watt, not as great at five watt, but it will be much quicker at 20 watt and still a fantastic fantastic result. And then you can flick it over to 40 watt and you're cutting nine mil plywood or MDF like butter. This review has been a little bit different for me, particularly if you compare it to some of my previous laser videos. And that's because in all honesty, I have struggled with how to put this video together and get my thoughts into a concise format. It's not because I don't love the machine. I've been testing the A9 now for the last couple of months, but I just kept coming back to these same core thoughts and feelings about 40 watt lasers in general. At 40 watts, you are talking about serious power and capability. And as a beginner, I just think there is information that you need Need and want to know if you are getting into lasering. So hopefully I've been able to share some of those today and help you along the way. In terms of my thoughts on the SFA9, I absolutely love it. It's an extremely capable machine. I love the Sculfin brand. They continually innovate, they listen to their customers and they adjust as they need. A great example of this is they have just released an infrared laser module to go with the A9 as well as a couple of their other models, which means you can now engrave on a bunch of different metals. That's been a whole in the diode market for a while and of course Sculfin comes to the rescue. I love with a flick of a switch you can go from 20 watts to 40 watts which means you really have all of your lasering needs covered in one machine. As always if you're looking to purchase one there are links down in the description below. A big thank you to Sculfin for the continued support of the Small Fry Creations brand and if you want to see the SFA9 in action be sure to be subscribed because I've got a video coming out where I'm going to try and prove why every maker could benefit from having a laser in the world. Workshop. If you've got a keen eye, you could see some of the projects that are sitting behind me will be included in that video. As always, if this video has been helpful and you've enjoyed it, you can help me out by hitting those subscribe and like buttons and I'll see you on the next one. Oh.